My name is Layla. I am a research analyst at the University of Miami, where most of my research focuses on uh, opioid uh, abuse, substance, sub, well, most substance use and abuse disorders. Um, I am not a really like advanced, obviously I'm not an advanced R user, that's why I'm here. I the only pick, I picked up R about three years ago. Um, and yeah, that's about it. I use R pretty regularly. I've built a couple packages. I have built uh, several sh shiny dashboards. Um, that's about it. Okay. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, also, Advanced R is really exciting for me and the book clubs because I've it's been sitting on my shelf. Um, actually, it was sitting on my shelf. Fun fact, I'm an, not the brightest person. Uh, I had a signed copy of the second edition of Advanced R by Hadley, um, and I gave it away as a door prize item at an Our Ladies event, because <clears throat> I also co-organize Our Ladies Miami. And I regret it because I miss it. And I want another one. <laughs> um, but anyways. Oh, you uh, had a hard copy of the book. I, yeah, I had, I had, when the second edition first came out, I bought it. And uh, then yeah. we had a Hadley Wickham was in Miami. And so we invited him to an Our Ladies event mm -hmm. and he signed my copy and then I gave it away. Right. Okay. It was a prize item. It was, and I regretted it because the winner, I think, was only there for free food. This is just what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he actually was there for R. I, I guess, I guess, I guess he's a, he's a graduate student or he's a graduate student because they like free food, PhD students. He wasn't, though. <laughs> Um, he's right. there probably for the free beer or something, you know, but whatever. I okay. hope he really, it's not just sitting on his coffee table, but I suspect it is. Anyways. Is it stylized R ladies, like the letter R? It yeah. Says, oh, oh, okay. I thought it was O-U-R. Like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, if you guys haven't heard, like, about don't know about our ladies our ladies like is an international organization that promotes gender equity in the R community and so there are chapters like all over the world and it's i've had that so many people ask me this and i'm, and I'm like no it's not our lady like <laughs> our lady it is our ladies so yeah i get surprisingly a lot of people get confused with this all right so I'm going to talk about chapter three, which is all about vectors. And supposedly, vectors are the most important family of data types in R. And he's, and I was careful not to put base R, even though Sham brought it up in, as a question today, because I had the exact same question, why Hadley specifically said base R. Um, so because we use vectors a lot within the tidyverse ecosystem and data frames, right? So data frames are, which I'll get to in a second, are just, you know, um, dimensionalized vectors. Um, so anyways, I, I intentionally left out base R in that, in this sentence. Um, and then there are vectors and there is the null value, which we're gonna go over um, which is a vector of length zero. Oh, there are two types. There's atomic vectors and then there are lists. So lists are on a class of their own. Some pretty um, important words to know throughout this chapter was attributes, which are a name list of metadata that um, you can supply. Dimensions, they're it's a, a type of attribute that allows for vectors to be converted to matrices or array. Um, and class is an attribute that powers S3 object system. Um, S3 get, for, talks about more in depth later on in the book, but um, it's a class, <clears throat> it's an object system. And when you define class, and there's, I'll talk about in a minute, certain classes um, that have, um, that are special. 
Um, so like factors, date times, data frames, and tibbles. Um, so the objectives of this chapter, one, to understand what an atomic vector is and the main types of atomic vector, to understand the importance of attributes, um, at a, uh, to understand at a high level S3 and the important vector types made by combining attributes with atomic vectors, four, to understand the difference between lists and atomic vectors, and then five, to understand the structure of data frames and tibbles. So let's start with atomic vectors. Um, they are, if you look at the hierarchy of vectors, you have atomic, there are four main types of atomic vectors. There are logicals, integers, doubles, and characters, and these also have a hierarchy. Um, what is a scalar? A scalar is basically the special syntax that are used to create a value. So for example, a logical has uh, takes true false, doubles are um, like these continuous uh, numbers, the decimal points or hexadecimal, or even can take infinite or um, NAN, which is not a number. <clears throat> Integers, so they're like doubles, but they're followed with an L and can't contain fractional values. So these are like whole numbers, one, two, three, and four. And I was curious about the L notation. So um, I looked it up. L notation is used because one, I is already taken by complex numbers. And two, because our integers are 32 bit long and thus the L shorthand makes sense in this, in this case, if you have anything longer than 32 bits, it's gonna get automatically converted to a double. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally strings um, or characters, that's anything surrounded by the um, double quote or the single quote. Yeah, so a question please. What's up, Shan? Yeah, question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Yeah, so um, from this picture, uh, from a mathematical point of view, um, I know what vectors are and what numeric and the, why, um, why naming this stuff atomic? Um, why are they atomic? Because in numeric vectors, logical, we all know them in mathematical point of view. Why are they named atomic? Um, that's a good point. A point that I don't remember the answer to right now, but I find out. Uh, it's atomic vectors are all the same type. So um, vectors can, can be like, yeah, exactly this yeah. diff graph, vectors can be a list or um, atomic and atomic must be the same type. Uh, okay. And to be fair, uh, just, because we are talking at the moment, uh, a scalar isn't like a special syntax. A scalar is by its sense in math mathematics, a single value. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, it, um, it, yeah. Yeah, so as you said, because of these values are scalar, that's why they're atomic. Like um, uh, they, they are atomic because R only knows vectors. And if you generate a scalar in R, it's automatic an atomic vector because oh. it's just a vector with one number. But yeah. in, in mathematics or in programming, a scalar would be similar, sing, a single uh, variable. But mm -hmm. in R, it's automatically a vector. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, so you have to have for atomic this everything in your vector of the same type mm. so those scalars that you yeah thank you have. okay so all right we have the lovely concatenate function that's the c with the parenthesis um how is that uh how is that used um essentially you use c to make longer vectors um and it always creates another atomic vector. So you cannot um, have different types in, uh, in C. It will automatic, automatically coerce. And I'll talk about coerce in a second. So for example, I create a vector called alphabet with A, B, C, and 1, 2, 5 with numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and a logical vector with true, false, and true. If I, can, if I um, flatten these, 
concatenate these two independent vectors, alphabet and one to five, it's going, it'll work and you'll get a vector, but they're all going to be character. So the hierarchy is that character trumps numeric or <clears throat> double or integers. So you'll end up with um, my new vec is going to be of character with length eight, eight. So the three letters and then one through five as character. Okay. Missing values. So missing values are often represented with MA, which stands for not applicable. And this is how R by default represents missing or unknown values. There are different kinds of NA values. Um, so there, <clears throat> if you've messed around um, with NA before or have had to deal with missing values um, in different operations in R, you'll notice that sometimes you have to convert, uh, actually use NAN for numeric or in a character for character vectors I and mean character strings um, to explicitly state. Um, otherwise, it may handle, uh, your operation may handle the NA um, value wrong, which is why I put the little warning sign here, missing values are infectious. So you have to be careful how you, um, when your data has missing values. So um, for example, if you were to put NA is greater than five, you get NA. <laughs> Even if you add a bang in front of NA to negate, you still end up with an NA. 10 times NA will return NA. <laughs> and then this is what gets me a lot, oops, is when you have NA in your data and you try and do something as simple as a mean or a sum, and you don't explicitly say NA.remove, then it will return an A. So be very cautious about uh, missing values in your data. The only exceptions where NAs behave is when you are you, it's used in conjunction with an object that already holds an identity. So if you raise NA to the power zero, um, it's going to equal one, just because the raising anything to zero produces one. And then, with logical operands, you have um, the hierarchy where um, NA values, um, NA or true returns true and NA and false returns false. Um, it's really uh, quite simple to detect a missing value. So the test for missing is is.na. So this returns a logical vector to um, the link, which is the length of the vector that you pass in and will get you all of um, which of your values are an na. The quickest way to get the count is to merely do a sum because logicals actually hold a value. So logicals, so false is equal to zero and true is equal to one. So if you were to do sum on your vector, you would get the count of how many NAs are in your vector that you supplied. That makes sense. So in my example, I only had one NA. All right, um, testing and coercion. So the best way to test to see an object's type is by using the is dot family of um, functions. There is is dot logical, is dot integer, is dot double, is dot character. All of these functions return a logical vector, the length of the same length of your vector that you pass in. So coercion is um, what happens when you mix objects of two different types, vectors or vectors of two different types, one of them will, if they don't match, based on the hierarchy, one will automatically get coerced into another, uh, into the other's class based on a fixed order. So character is at the top of the hierarchy, then double, then integer, then logical, and logical is at the very bottom. So if I were to do C, five and D, 
that gets the five will get coerced into a character because the D is a character string. This is pretty useful when you have logicals because like I said previously, fall, uh, logicals hold a value. So false equals zero and true equals one. So if I had a vector of logicals, I can do uh, mathematical operations on them like sum and mean to get the count and the proportion of trues in my, um, in my vector. So here are the, the first set of exercises. So how do you create raw and complex scalars? Test your knowledge of the vector coercion rules by predicting the output of the following uses of C. Y is one equal one true. Y is negative one less than false um, true. And Y is one less than two equal false. Why is the default missing value NA a logical vector? And what's so special about logical vectors? And precisely, what do is atomic, is numeric, and is vector test for? So I'm still not entirely clear how we should go about the exercises, given also that we kind of started a little bit late. Um, I want to I want to have time for discussion. Um, I did attempt to um, um, give answers to them when I could. So I guess we can, and questions don't even actually show up. So, um, so I guess we can talk about them. And this is just like, I didn't verify these at all. These are my answers. Um, so I think for me, um, I, I just did what was suggested for the first question and looked up the help documentation for raw and complex. And to create a raw, Scalar, you just do raw or as dot raw or char to to raw, and it's the same for complex. So complex and as dot complex. The only difference with raw is that char to raw <clears throat> converts a character. Um, I think I, as the sum of its bytes, I'm not entirely certain, but it will turn it to a number. Um, and then secondly, uh, it says test your knowledge of the vector coercion rules by predicting the output of the following uses. So in the first example, um, you would end up with one to zero, one and zero, because false is going to get, is illogical and it's going to get coerced into uh, a numeric. Um, a and one, because A is a string, it's an, one is going to get coerced into a character. And then it's the same with the third one. Um, the integer is going to get coerced into a, um, the, sorry, the logical is going to get co coerced into an integer. Um, now, I wasn't sure for number three, the first one. I'm not entirely sure why one equal equal one character string one is true, but I, I do understand that negative one is less than false because false evaluates to zero. And so zero is, is negative one is less than zero. And then um, same for one. So character trumps a numeric. So it would end up being um, the string would be greater than the integer. And I think that might be maybe the reason why one equal equal one is true because maybe um, the numeric one is gonna get coerced into a string, thus making them equal. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm not actually paying attention to the chat, so just because. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. Sorry. My eyeballs get super dry, I think, with allergies. All right. Okay. Um, so what is the default missing value NA a logical, why is the default missing value NA a logical vector, and what's so special about logical vectors? 
This one I'm not sure about. I didn't. Um, I don't know why NA is an illogical vector. What's so what's special about logical vectors? I mean, what's special about logical vectors is that they can get evaluated. This I understand. And so in, in the example, false would be zero. But I don't know, I guess any character would be a char. So then that would be a character in a character. Like the false, I don't know if, if false would end up being a character false or I actually have no idea. I guess I can just pop that in. Oh, wait. Oops, you guys can't see that. <laughs> um, yeah, so C, so the false would end up getting turned into, coerced into a word, a string of false, because we've specified NA character. So this NA trumps the logical, everything trumps logical. So still doesn't really help me with why NA, why the default missing value NA is a logical vector. Anyways. It's, it's exactly because of this reason you explained, because yeah. if it would not be the default, always when you would set NA, it would, coerce upwards to the other one. So if NA is lower than everything else, it the NA will get upwards. But yeah. okay. That's a good perspective. That's a good that make that actually makes a lot of sense. So is it just really versatile? Okay. All right. And then <clears throat> the last question is precisely what do is atomic, is numeric, and is vector test for? Um, I started to answer this question <laughs> and I didn't finish. Um, <clears throat> all I saw was that, uh, it checks for as X an atomic type, but I remember in the chapter, Hadley said, these particular three tests do not test for what you think they do. which is odd because I use numeric all the time and it checks, maybe is, <clears throat> maybe it just checks to see if any double, if in, anything is numeric, so like doubles or integers. So I use is numeric a lot to test if a certain value is numeric, but regardless of whether it's an integer or a double. So maybe um, these particular functions aren't uh, specific to um, the other the other tests, where the other tests are like is dot integer, is dot factor, things like that. I think these are more um, general. That would be my answer. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about attributes. So attributes are like key value pairs. They're metadata to an object. Um, so I just put a little screenshot of some data that I'm working with um, to get a better sense of attributes. So when you're doing modeling and you have K fold validation set, um, you end up with a data frame with, of 10, and, in my case, I'm doing tenfold, so 10 observations with two variables. So there's only two variables, but within those two variables, you have one called, it's called a 
splits and splits is actually a list of 10. And within that list there, each container has a list of four. So this is like the metadata for that um, list. So the first thing doesn't actually have a name. Um, it's just a list of four. And then you have dollar sign data is the first uh, attribute to this list, um, which is a tibble of 4,400. And then the, the attributes for each of the variables. So factor with two levels, et cetera. So each of everything in that, in the data. So there, it's actually nested. <clears throat> um, it, you can view or see the, set the attributes of an object by using a adder or ATTR or attributes to see all the attributes in one time. Um, but a lot of times they are lost. So even so, a lot of um, uh, these kind of things, um, although you can set them, they will usually get lost during certain operations, except for names and dimensions, which are two important um, attributes that set um, vector types and <clears throat> S3 objects. So let's see. So for this example, if I were to do adder of A and assign a new attribute, so my A is just a vector and I'm assigning a new attribute called blah and I give it one, five, three, two, and I were to set, oops, sorry, um, see the structure of the attributes, you can see that it's actually um, the attributes returns a list of one that is a character string of four, of length four with one, five, three, and two. If I were to just type in A, you can see all the information. So you can see the actual values. Those are integers, one, five, three, and two, but there's an attribute called blah that contain one, five, three, and two as strings. So I can still do sum of A because it's a numeric vector, but it holds metadata, which is the written, um, the numbers written out. Yeah, so I have a question. So why this metadata, I, I mean, attribute useful? So um, it's, I've found, to be honest, the only time I've found attributes useful is when I've dealt with S4 objects. Um, and these, I don't even know how to explain S4 objects very well, um, but I've received data um, in a sense that were kind of like, um, like in boxes. So like there's the, the whole data object. And then in this chunk, they're like that holds a data frame and inside of which are um, things that describe um, like uh, geographic information. So like it, the data had like lat and longs. And so um, I don't know, it's hard to explain without visualizing. Um, so it was good to see just kind of in my uh, my global environment pane, like just a visualization of each of the, like each, what, are, what those, um, what each of those data chunks hold um, without having to click through them. Honestly, I mean, aside from that, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced they're super useful because they they do um, they are ephemeral. They, they'll leave, like they disappear when you do different operations. So, like if you create a new table um, and do some like group buys or summarizing, for example, the attributes usually get lost. I 
And honestly, attributes are kind of a nuisance. <laughs> and I actually am more lean, lean more towards attributes being a nuisance because I've, in several occasions, I have had to clear the attributes. Yeah. Um, I, I think Hannes want to explain something in the chat. He oh. wrote something. Um, I think if you can talk, Hannes, maybe it will be useful. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I think metadata is just as explained. It's uh, the, the attribute is mainly to for meta information. So if you have spatial data, it could say uh, in what convention you have the data. Uh, you can also set attributes to functions as I, as I posted in the chat. So you could explain what your function does. So okay. one can then simply look up, hey, what does this function? Do you explain All it? Right. The attribute, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, okay, right, right. Thank you. Okay, so, um, and the next thing is names. So names are really useful. Um, there are three ways to name a vector. Uh, there is one right at the start when you create it. So I have uh, a new vector called about me, and it's a named vector. So when you run it, you can see in the uh, environment pane that it's a named character vector where they're kind of like labels. So these are really important. Um, first, the, uh, the names of the first thing is first, last, and height <clears throat> with the actual value. So if you look at, the ve at this vector, it'll hold three character strings. My first name, uh, Layla, Buzuba, and 160 as a string because it's going to get coerced. Um, or you can use the names function. So let's say I already had some values. I had a vector with some values and I wanted to name them. You can use the names and then assign a vector to of names to that um, object. Or the third way is with the set names function. So that is simply just first argument is your um, values and the second argument is your names. Honestly, for in my opinion, the first way is the easiest. You just set it while you create it. Um, and then if you need to get the names, you merely just type names of the attribute, I mean, sorry, of the vector. And then if you need to remove names, there is a function of, called unname or you can simply just assign null to names of that object. Yeah, I have a question. What's up? Um, with the named vectors like this, could you use this as a column in a data frame? Yeah, so um, you can actually store names. Um, so if I wanted to make this a data frame, I could uh, set... Um, vars to names of about me and then i could uh and that so that would that would create a uh character vector of link three with just the names and then i can um pass that like if you use tibble you can do um um the three, you can actually put that vector or you can just immediately like put, I think you can actually put names of whatever vector you're trying to create the column names of. Um, and then uh, the values that are going to go there. I don't, I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> um, let's see if I can. If I can show it. So if I were to set ours, his names of about me, you get these three things. Then you can set, I think you can do, oops. I think it might actually already be loaded. So I have my thing. Um, so it's, this may not 
I don't know if this is actually going to create three rows or three columns, but I want to see what happens if I just do one, two, and three. So I guess I do have to specify. So it actually created a um, three rows, but you could just do a transform. I can't figure out the details right off the top of my head right now, but yeah, totally. That's totally a possibility. Okay, so let's move on to dimensions. Um, dimensions allow a vector to behave like a two-dimensional matrix or a multi-dimensional array. So a matrix can only have two dimensions. Uh, to go ahead and answer your question, Sham, what is a matrix and what is an array? Um, and I'm not even joking, like I had this when I was writing this slide, I, I just like heard your voice in my head being like, what's a matrix and what's an array? <laughs> So I went ahead and uh, I I added a def of, like a formal definition. Yeah, for me, um, you need to explain how the arrangement of matrix and array are because they confuse me when you run them from this slide. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, so matrix is a collection of elements of the same data type, so numeric, character, logical, but arranged into a fixed numbers of rows and columns. So that's a matrix. Um, it's only two dimensional uh, and you can use the matrix function to create it. An array is basically, you have a third dimension. So it basically creates, uh, you can store data in two dimensions, but then you add a third dimension. So in this example, two, three, and four, it creates four rectangular matrices, which are two by three. And um, that's how it's stored. So here's the, <laughs> here's the visual for you. So the matrix uh, one by six, you specify two rows so that the arguments for matrix is um, your values, the number of rows and the number of co columns. So it, turn, it spits out a two, uh, two, -dimensional ma uh, two dimensional matrix with two rows and three columns and it goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. So, but if I wanted to make this an array, then I could pass in this a third dimension, which is number two. So it creates the, this thing twice. So you end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, then the third dimension, which is th the second, uh, the second table or matrix, I guess in this sense, this would be a matrix with the rest of the numbers through 12. I've never actually had to use an array. Um, it doesn't make sense to me still. Uh, in practice. Um, uh, how does this array work? I didn't understand the arrangement. Please, can you explain again the arrangement here? Sure. So this. In the array function, let's say you're passing in values one to 12. Then you have to specify the um, arrangement. So like what, how many numbers, how many numbers of columns and how many rows you want your data spread across. Um, and because it's an array, you have to specify a third, this third dimension. So it's multidimensional, arrays are multidimensional. I've never, I've not worked with multidimensional data. So I've, I don't have a, like a practical application, but I, oops, sorry. You can visualize here that the first two is, is the number of rows. So you have one and two, the number of columns, one, two, three. Sorry, I keep clicking that and it changes the slide. Um, one, two, and three, and then by two. So like it will um, spit out two um, tables. 
Right. So <laughs> if I understand, array is n dimensional. So the last two can be like six, any number because it's n dimensional. So can we have like um, given like array one, column 11, then we have two. What will happen in that case? Uh, what will, because the arrangement is not evenly distributed. So okay. if I have one is to 11, then I have the same arrangement two, three, two. What will happen in that case? I suspect that it will repeat, but I'm also curious. So let's see. Um, here. Um, this is attributes, naming, dimensions. Okay. So if I were to do 11 and set that to Y, Y now looks like this. It starts over. It starts over? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it recycling? Is it recycling? Yeah, it's recycling, right? Yeah. So you can see here in the, my global environment, Y is still an inte integer vector, but it now has this third dimension. So it's basically saying that there are one to two rows, one to three columns, and one to two Z, whatever this is like things. <laughs> <laughs> Dimension, right? I don't so know. Two, <laughs> well, it's not even, it's, it's, it's not, this, this is two dimensional. This is, a, this is two dimensional because it's N by, N by column, N by column by, now with an array, it's n by um, x by z, z. I feel like you're still confused, Shan, but I am a little bit as well. So whatever. <laughs> um, all right. So you can also modify an object in place by setting dim. So this is to figure out the dimensions of a, an, a matrix or an array, you can, um, you can use the dim function, but you can also set the dimensions. So I had a vector called A that was a numeric vector um, that was one dimensional. So like just one dimension, it just one, <laughs> one by, um, one by four. Um, actually, I guess that's still two dimensional. Sorry. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to reset the reset and convert it to a matrix. So you can do that by doing, uh, setting the dimensions of a to, to be two by two. And that's what it ends up looking like one, three, five, two, like a square. What about an array? Can you pass in three numbers? Um, I think so. So if I were to do, um, I think it would be the same thing here. I think it would just, uh, recycle. So dim of a. Hmm. Just not. I guess not. It says, let's see what a looks like. Oh, maybe it's because I already, it already has. It's already a two by two, but then honestly, product 12 does not match the length of object. Huh. What if I, oh, let me just create like a clean one and just make it, And then set dim of B to be three, two, two by two by two. See. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no. I guess once you, when you add a third dimension with dim, you have, 
they have to match the length of the object. So I have to have passed in, like this object has to be at le least uh, eight long. Like what happens if I did this? Now it works. Oh. Hmm. Maybe it doesn't work in that way, I guess. <laughs> but as we saw in the previous example with when Sham asked about 12, if we change it to 11, it just recycled. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it recycled. So it started off with one, even though it didn't match, it didn't have the same length. I mean, the recycling is good because you can also use a single number. So if you want to generate something with only ones, you only write one and it recycles. So it makes absolutely sense that it recycles there. But does it not if you change the dimensions? Because then you would break your data, maybe. I guess so. Um, another question. Um, when do we really use array? In what sense, in um, practical use case of array? Because I have not been using array always. I've just been using data frame and vectors. I don't know array. When you're keeping data frames in a, uh, inside a data frame, like as a column, maybe then? I'm not sure. I can't really answer this question because I don't really use arrays. Uh, arrays are actually used in the image processing. Like that's one of the use cases. You know, each image, like a, a colored image is actually a three-dimensional array. Yeah. Uh, so it's used there okay but for data analysis we don't use array right let me just uh, use like if you're constructing neural networks uh, you mm -hmm. know from scratch then you yeah. use arrays multi-dimensional arrays right okay so okay yeah yeah that makes sense all right so here are the exercises for this little subsection so how is set names implemented and how is unnamed implemented how, what does dim return when applied to a one dimensional vector? And when might you use n row and n call? Describe the following three objects. And an early draft is used, uh, used this code to illustrate structure. Um, I was able to um, come up with some solution except for the last one. So for the first question, um, both of these function engage the names function, set names and unname, except for set names um, specifies the names of the object. So it's basically the second argument of set names. So if you remember, set names takes two arguments. It's the values and the names. And all this function, all set names does in the background, if you look at the source code, it just uses the names function to set that second argument as the names to the first argument. Um, and then for unname, it just basically sets, assigns null to names of the, um, the first argument of unname. Um, what does dim return when applied to a one dimensional vector? Um, and when might you use n row and n call? So um, when you, when you, um, run dim on a one dimensional vector and you get uh, null. Um, and then n row and n call are used to determine the number of rows and columns for a matrix or a data frame or array, but not a vector. So you can't use n row or n call in a vector. Um, and then how would you describe the following three objects? So these are three different arrays, except the five is placed in three different positions. So X1 basically is a one by one, um, but five times, replicated five times. Um, so it's basically just the numbers one through five. 
and then five times. Um, and then this X2 is um, one, one by five matrix. So it's one row with by five columns. So one, two, three, four, five. And then um, the X3 is a five by one. So it's five rows with one column. So it's one, two, three, four, five in a row one time. So actually X2 and X3 are matrices. And then I don't know how to answer question four. I couldn't find in the help anything about comment. So why you don't see a comment attribute when you run this? I'm not sure if any of you got through these exercises. Okay, so I'm gonna continue since we're a little pressed for time. So S3 atomic vectors. So again, atomic vectors are uh, vectors of the same type. Um, so having a class attribute makes an S3 object. So these S3 objects are going to behave differently than regular vectors when passed to generic functions. And there are um, a few types. There's factors, which has level categorical data, um, dates, these are dates with days, date times, these are dates with days and seconds or subseconds, uh, and they're essentially stored in POSIX CT vectors, and then diff times, these are durations. So factors are vectors that only contain predefined, predefined values. Um, they're really useful when you know the set of possible values, but they're um, but not all the possible values are present in your data set. So for example, I have defined a factor. Um, I have some example data here. So I have insurance types, married, single, unknown, separated, divorced, widowed, unmarried. Um, and then this is my actual data. So I am creating a factor vector that has um, six values, <clears throat> married, single, married, divorced, single, and separated. And I set the levels to insurance type, which is this vector up here. So when you look at the attributes of this vector, you see that there are seven levels and that the vector is of class factor. You can order the factors just like regular factors, but um, the orders are going to be meaningful and you use a vector, uh, sorry, a function called ordered. So in, like in the previous example, I just uh, created my age groups. I have four different age groups and then I have my data. So I have six people and I set the levels equal to age groups. But this time when you look at age groups, uh, you, when you look at age, you see the values, but you also see the levels and their hierarchy. So less than 18 is less than 1834, which is less than 35, 64, five, and then 65 plus. Um, note many base R functions automatically convert character vectors into factors. So be cautious to use the, the option string as factors equals false. This is base R. So this is one of the, um, the biggest, I don't know, I don't know what I wanna say biggest, but one of the biggest highlights of the, the tidyverse and tibbles, for example, that is by default um, false. So he had two different recommended readings, string as factors and authorized biography and string as factors equals psi. Yeah. So I just added them in here. But um, I think this string as factor equals true is changed in R by default is now uh, false. Um, it has been changed from R 4.0, I guess, um, last year. So I checked the GitHub for this book to create an issue. I see already people submitted an issue that Hadley should um, update the book, um, that uh, this section is update, outdated because um, steering as factor is not true by default now in R. Yeah, 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Not like I really, well, actually I still do for package development. You want to stick to base R and this is always a thing. This was always a thing. And in my head, I was like, everyone I know sets this, sets this value. So why is it not the default? But that's the yeah. Thing. Oops. Okay. So date, date times and durations. Dates are built on double vectors. So, and have a, a special class called date and no other attribute. And essentially the double is the number of days since um, sub, uh, January 1st, 1970. So if I were to create a, a variable called today, it's gonna hold um, 2021-0330. If I were to remove the class date from today, you end up with 18,716. And that's the number of days since January 1st, 1970. There are two, then there are date times. Um, there's two ways of storing date time information, POSIX CT and POSIX LT. But from what I understand, POSIX CT is the most, um, is the default and most commonly used um, type. So I can create a variable called right now. And I use the function called as POSIX, POSIX CT with today's date and the time. So it was 10.38 AM. And I can specify time zone as America, New York. So when I it's stored, it's stored as such, EDT. Um, if I were to do type of though, of this value, it's gonna return a double, but it has the attributes of class POSIX CT and the time zone. So it's still stored as a double. So essentially date and date times are just doubles with an added class attribute on top. Durations are um, the amount of time between a pair of dates and they're stored in their own as their own class called diff time. So you can set your own diff time. Um, one week would essentially just be as dot diff time, um, the number one, and units. So there are different kinds of units that you can store here. There's days, there's weeks, there's minutes and hours. Um, so if you, if you do the same thing as uh, a date and look at the type of a duration, it still returns a double because again, it's just all of these things are doubles with different classes on top of them, uh, different class attributes on top of them. So you can see if you do attributes of one week, you see it's class diff time and the unit is a week. So these are the exercises, sorry. Um, what sort of object does table return? What's its type? What attribute does it have? How does the dimensionality change as you tabulate more variables? What happens to a factor when you modify its levels? What does this code do? And so I attempted the solutions for this one. Um, so table returns a, a table. It's its own class. Um, the attributes of a table uh, is um, the number of dimensions, the names of the dimensions, and the class. Um, I didn't answer the third question because I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand it very well. How does the dimensionality change as you tabulate more variables? I didn't really tabulate any variables. I just converted a vector that I had into a table. So I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, what happens to a factor when you modify the levels? So for this one, um, it just reverses the factor order. So you have the le letters is a stored object in R, uh, A through Z. And it, F1 is just storing that vector as a factor. And um, setting the levels of F1 to reverse, so rev is reverse. So essentially it's the, the levels, I mean, it's the letters of the alphabet, but the, its levels are in reverse order. 
So how are these F2 and F3 different than F1? So F2 makes the letters of the alphabet a factor in reverse order, but the levels are in the right order. So they reverse the levels of F1, and that's how it's different than F, F2. The F2 did not um, adjust the levels. It just adjusted the letters themselves. F3 is the alphabets in the right order, but the levels are reversed. So this is just taking the factor, making it, um, making, taking the letters and making them factor, and then the levels are in reverse order. And then F1, both are reversed. So the order of the alphabet is reversed and the levels of the factor are reversed. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, lists. So lists are um, a nice object because they can contain any atomic type or even other lists. So you can contain anything in a list, just like from the previous section when uh, Hodo spoke, they're like, you can think of lists as like containers. You can have anything, um, you can store anything in a list, essentially. They don't have to be of the same type. And even when you copy, they are essentially, um, the elements of a list are references. So not everything uh, is copied when you are um, making a copy of, when you make a copy of a list, it's still pointing to its reference. So if I make a list and I call it, and it stores, in the list is stored and an, the number one, a logical, a double, a string, and another list. And you look at the structure of that list, you end up uh, with list of five in which it contains numeric, logical, numeric character, and then another list of three numbers. Uh, you can also nest lists with the use of the concatenate function. So I can have a list with a list and then a vector created with the concatenate function. So if you look at the structure of my list two, you get a list of two, which includes um, a nested list of two and then a numeric vector. And then you can do type if you look at type of my list two, you still get a uh, type list. And then the interesting thing is, is that because these are reference type, like the elements in a list are referenced, this object size does not um, vary greatly as, as very, it doesn't vary as greatly as you would think. So um, my list two is 304 bytes, but if I were to replicate this object, three times, it only goes up by 32 bytes. Data frames and tibbles. So I think everyone is really aware of data frames and tibbles, especially if you've worked with the um, Tidyverse ecosystem. Um, tibbles are your friend. Um, they're really helpful. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail because I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Essentially, these are vectors that are built on top of lists. So a data frame is a named list of vectors with attributes for column names, row names, and its class data frame. So it's essentially named list of vectors that contains attributes. The main constraint of data frames is that the length of each vector must be the same. So if you have ever tried to join or merge or a call bind um, or row bind, no, call bind a um, vectors and they're not of the same length, if it actually runs without throwing an error, you'll get a lot of NA values at the bottom. But a lot of times with just 
data frames. If you use data.frame, it'll probably give you an error. Um, data frames have row names and column names, and the names of a data frame are the column names. So if you run names on a data frame, this function, you get the column names. Um, and then data frames have n row. So to get the number of rows, you run n row and then n call. And then if you do length on a data frame, you get the number of columns, not the number of rows. So just to give you an example, on the empty cars data, you get type of, if you do type of empty cars, you actually get a list. However, if you run the attributes of empty cars, you get the names of the, um, of the variables, the row names, which empty cars has row names, which you'll see in a second, tibbles highly discourage, um, which are the names of the cars themselves. And the class is actually of data.frame. And if I were to do n row and n call, you'll see it's a, a 32 by 11 data frame. So this is where tibbles come in. So tibbles are cre were created out of frustration on how people use and design data frames. Um, the main takeaway for tibbles is that they do less but complain more. <laughs> so they make it uh, easier for your programs in that it follows a set, um, set of rules and guidelines. And then if you don't follow uh, if you kind of stray, it will complain loudly. Um, they do share the same structure as data frames, but includes an additional class. So if you ever run a, this attributes on a tibble, you'll see an additional like data dot frame slash tibble underscore df. And the default behavior is false for strings as factors, and it discourages row names. So um, if you do have row names and you wanna to convert to a tibble, you can actually just use, maybe this answers somebody's questions earlier. Um, you can use this function called row names to column and it will convert your uh, row names. Um, no, it will only convert, it will convert it to a brand new column um, that you can specify the name of that column. So in this case, I would do row names to column, uh, car name, and then it will convert, it will take all these row names and convert it to a new column in my tibble. But the kind of the downside for, uh, and one of the reasons why it discourages row names is that row names are actually metadata. So the, as you can see right here, this is the attribute, this data frame holds an attribute called row names and data is still data. So that's um, more, I guess, um, memory, I guess, that you have to, even though as in this example, it's very small. Um, poor abstraction for labeling rows, um, and then row names have to be unique. Otherwise it will, um, R will create uh, in place for you weird row names if it's not unique. Tibbles also print prettier. They only show the first 10 rows and the number of columns that will fit on the screen. Each call is labeled with a type. Wide columns are truncated. And then if you print a table in the console, colors are used to highlight the important information into the console, which is really nice. Okay. And then finally, um, I guess we'll just skip this. Uh, the last bit of information is the null. Um, type of null is null. Null oh. values are... Yeah, I have a question. What's up, Shan? Yeah, so um, Hadley made um, a statement where he said um, about recycling in data frame. He said both data frame and table will recycle shorter input. However, while data frame automatically recycle columns that are an integer multiple of the longest column, table will only recycle vectors of length one. So I'm not sure why the idea, why table recycle vectors of length one only. Why, um, what is the rationale behind this? 
I'm guessing it's the complain more thing because in general, vector recycling can be really dangerous if you don't know what's going to happen. If you do, it's but, really convenient, but. Yeah, okay. Well, um, data frame recycle of multiple one. Um, um, if you have, uh, for instance, um, they say there's column that are an integer multiple of the longest column. So for instance, I have a column with two and I have a column with four. Then the column with two will be multiplied, will be recycled to match the four. But in, in this case, uh, table will not work with this type, right? Yeah, you'd have to manually write like a rep thing or something to replicate it. Okay. All right, you can go on. Thank you. Okay. I kind of want to know, maybe Sham, you can like type your questions in Slack because I want to, um, it makes sense about the your first point about the complaining loudly. Um, uh, I guess I don't know who answered that question. Yeah, but... you can continue. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is the last point of this chapter was explaining um, nulls. Uh, nulls always have a length zero and can't have any attributes. Um, they, if you do a type of null, it will return a null. If you do length of null, you'll get zero. If you assign null to a value, uh, to an object and you look at the, try to look at the attribute, if, or sorry, if you try to assign attributes to that object, you're going to get an error because you're attempting to assign attributes uh, on a null value, which is not allowed. Um, and then you can always test for null um, by using the is.null function on an object. On a, um, and so if I were to do it on X, you'll see that it's true because it's only holding null. Um, null is essentially uh, like, a, um, like a blink. From what I understand, null versus NA, NA is for single values. You can have NAs where null can is represent uh, represents um, an entire like vector um, object instead of a, just a single value. Um, so some use cases where nulls come in handy are to represent an empty vector um, or to represent an absent vector. So this is actually, I, I use nulls when I, um, if I were to write a function and uh, the default is of an argument, I set it to null so that um, the user can um, specify um, the, the value of that function um, otherwise can choose to specify a value of that function. It doesn't necessarily have to have a value and the without breaking my function, essentially. Um, but yeah, I think that is all I have. Are there any other questions? Right, great. Um, thank you, Leila, for- Sorry, we went way over time. Wonderful presentation. Yeah, I guess maybe, um, uh, as we have made mention um, last week, maybe uh, we should be going fast through the content at the end as who, um, as um, the pre holder did last week. When we finish the content, maybe we can come back to the exercises. Maybe I don't know if this um, workflow will be uh, because some people, they have only one hour to join the sessions. And mm -hmm. yeah, so if we finish the content much faster, um, uh, some people can stay for the um, exercises they wish to and people, yeah. So I think maybe we can change the workflow that uh, we can present the content first and the questions uh, and solution may come after. So people can wish to stay to listen for the exercises, right? Okay, good. Um, so uh, anyone 
has question. Right, who is going to have the week chapter? Um, I will mm. check. I don't. I don't know. I will check anyway. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just All catching right. up on the chat. See if I missed anything. Oh no. Okay. I think we covered everything. Yeah. All right. Um, Hannes, you you haven't picked a chapter yet. <laughs> Call now. <laughs> Yeah, you haven't picked it. Maybe the last one, C++ or <laughs> the difficult <laughs> ones. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for joining today's session. Um, um, and thank you, Leila, for the wonderful presentation. And I think we say goodbye and we see you next week. Thank right. you. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you.